These are the words. Oh, good morning. <laughs> rudeness is as rudeness does. These are the words of the Spirit of Truth through our elder brother, the Apostle Paul, in the first 16 verses of Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, that is, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I have the privilege of being able to introduce Asa Hart, our elder candidate for pastor of discipleship. Uh, Asa comes to us having served in a variety of pastoral positions uh, over the last uh, several years, a few different churches, both in Oregon and in the rest of the country. Uh, he and his wife, Krista, live in Milwaukee. They have one son, John Luther, and a daughter on the way. Um, he's going to be bringing the message this morning, but I wanted you to know that that comes as a part of a process that's been going on for a while. Uh, Asa was interviewed in the winter a few times by the pastoral search committee, uh, who also checked his references. Uh, he was then forwarded to the leadership personnel ministry team, who uh, interviewed him, checked references, made sure that he was elder qualified. Uh, he was most recently interviewed by the elder council, uh, who uh, put him through the, the gauntlet of questions. And, uh, and then forward him to you as the church body. According to our constitutional process, because of the fact that he would be part of the preaching team, uh, he gets to preach for two weeks uh, here among you, so you can listen and discern how the Lord is speaking through him. And so this morning, I get the joy of introducing him, but I just want to say something personally about that, and then I'll um, turn it over to him. I had the opportunity of meeting Asa early on in the process uh, because I got to be part of the search committee. And it was a joy to meet him, to get to know him, and as I have gotten to know him even more, uh, I have come to really appreciate him, his heart, and his ministry. And I would just say, I think he is a man who clearly loves Jesus, um, who obviously loves his family, who fervently loves the Word of God, and as you're going to hear this morning, uh, deeply loves discipleship in the church. And so I'm going to invite Asa to come. Would you give a Damascus Community Church warm welcome to Asa Hart? 
and I'm going to pray for you. And let me pray for him before we turn it over. Father, thank you for this privilege of being here this morning to worship together. Thank you for Asa. Lord, I pray that you would speak through him. Lord, that beyond the fact that he's here to candidate for a pastoral position, Lord, help us to discern and hear your voice. May he speak and let them be as the oracles of God that we might understand your heart for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Andy. Oh, all right. And thank you, Brother Kyle. That was not me. All right. <laughs> Uh, it's not church without uh, some adventure. There we go. All right. Damascus, how are you? It's good after uh, these months to be in front of you, to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, thank you, Andy, for that warm and generous introduction. Um, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually feeling a little bit naked up here. The, uh, I'm used to reading the text first myself. And, uh, and Brother John, you did that so well. I'm, 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 uh, I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, but I do want to take you back, if we can say things simply, to the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And at 16 through 20 really is, is, is the, the whole story there. But 18 through 20 is Jesus' words there. And Jesus gives us how, his how-to disciple right there. He says, go therefore, let's, let's pull that up on the, he says, uh, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and, or, or, and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so from that, we can, we, we can see Jesus' twofold how-to disciple. And that's one, baptize. Baptize. That's evangelism, baptism. And then, and then two, to teach all that I have commanded you. To teach all that I have commanded you. And so that's the how. That's the how. And so what we're going to see today from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 is Jesus' plan, Jesus' ground, Jesus' locus for discipleship of his people. And so uh, we just read, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to have, I, I got to do it. I'm going to have to read the text. So in your, in, your, in your copy of God's word, let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, 
we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you so much for your kindness. You have been faithful to your people. You have been faithful to your son, Jesus. You have been faithful to your word, and we can trust your excellent word. You have given us your plan, your plan for your people to grow, your plan for your people to be a display of your glory. And I pray that we would hear that word today. Father, may you cause your people at Damascus Community Church to pursue loving unity in the truth. May you cause them to attend to the gifts of the teaching of the word. May you cause them to become an expositional people. We pray this in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, it is indeed Father's Day. I know this because the video told me so. I also know this because I saw it in the calendar as I got up this morning and, and looked out. My wife and son were still asleep, so there was no surprise this morning. But uh, praise the Lord, that's, that's just the way it is when you're a pastor. Uh, and so we'll, we'll celebrate that afterward. Fathers are, are, are so important in giving identity, giving confidence, security, and a godly heritage to their children. I, as, as Andy mentioned, I, I myself am a daddy to John Luther. And he's, at, he's just about three. And it's just such a fun stage where he's, he's really trying to test his strength now. And so he, he'll push against daddy and I'll, I'll give him a little bit of resistance and then I'll fall down. And he, I knocked over daddy. And then he jumps and dog piles on me. I love doing that. I love laughing with him. I love when, when we pray together. He, he leans in and he presses his forehead like right against mine right there. And he, said, he, he just interrupts my prayer and goes, we're talking to Jesus. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right, buddy. We're, we're talking to Jesus. I love that. It, it, it reminds me of, of, of my dad. Uh, and, and I just have so many good memories with him. And I, 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 he, he'd open the Bible at the breakfast table. Uh, a godly heritage is so important, fathers. Uh, continue in that. Strive for that. Do that in your home. My dad took the Word of God seriously. It was so valuable. So many good memories. He also played with us. And he also, he laughed with us. I, I, I love my dad's laugh. He had this, uh, this laugh. If you paid attention, uh, there's like first gear, second gear, third gear, and fourth gear. And, and first gear was like the Elmer Fudd, you know, kind of uh, laugh, that staccato you know, laugh, and then it'd get higher pitched as it kicked into the different gears, and then the fourth gear was just this, this high-pitched laugh of delight, and, and it, was so, it was so hilarious because my dad's a big man, and you'd hear this high-pitched laughter that just didn't, didn't match well with his, with his body, and so we would just start laughing, and we'd just have this wonderful time laughing together because dad was laughing. And so uh, growing up, uh, we, we had this kind of standing appointment as a family where, where we'd, every Tuesday night, we'd gather around the TV and we'd watch Home Improvement to hear my dad, to, to, to watch it, to enjoy it, but to hear my dad laugh. And so if you've ever seen that show, every, every episode started with the exact same bit. Uh, Tim, the Toolman Taylor, he would host a, a Home Improvement show and he would always have an expert on who was teaching him how to do a task, a job, you know, on the construction site or in the remodel. And the expert would be telling him what to do, how to go about things carefully. And, and, and Tim would, of course, be like, no, we need more power. No, no, I know how to do it. Step aside, expert. And then he'd pick up his power sander, his power tool, what have you. And he'd just, he'd go at it against the expert's advice. And it would always end with just the same gag. It would electrocution or, or water shooting everywhere or, or some injury, some fall. And we, and we would all laugh at that. And Dad, Dad's 
fourth gear laugh would be going there in the background, and we'd start laughing harder. We, we, we laugh at that because it, it's pretty obvious what's about to happen. It, it, we laugh at it because it's, it's, it's true. How many men here, just, just when, when you get the Ikea furniture out, you throw away that instruction manual? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we, we all do this. I can remember I, I, my, my, my wife always said, hey, don't operate the table saw with me not home. And what did I do one, one day? I operated the table saw without her home and ran my hand right through that thing. And, and oh, man, Tim the Tool Man Taylor right here. I, I lived it all over again. We laugh at that. We laugh, right, rightfully so. I, I made myself look silly. Tim made himself look silly each week. But brothers and sisters, Jesus, his idea is the church. His plan for your growth and your good is the church. He knows what he's talking about. He gave us his word. And if we ignore it, if we say, no, I've I've got my own plan of discipleship. I've got my own method for this. We are worse than Tim the Toolman Taylor ignoring the expert. We are worse than that. Brothers and sisters, we do not need more freedom. We do not need more autonomy. We do not need a right form of government. We do, we, we do not need a new fangled plan or program. We need Jesus' word. We need the body of Christ. The church is Jesus' idea. It is his discipleship plan for his people. And he has given gifts to the local church so that his people can build one another up toward God-imaging, good-doing, doctrine-loving, Christ-like maturity so that we might be a display of his glory to the watching world. That's our, that's our message today. That's, that's the message of Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And, and we're going to see that in three points. Uh, point number one. The manner of the gospel. The manner of the gospel. Point number two. The magnanimity of the gift giver. The magnanimity of the gift giver. Number three. The maturing ministry of the gift getters. The maturing ministry of the gift getters. Number one, the manner of the gospel. So Paul calls the Ephesians church to pursue loving unity in the truth. He begins with this appeal, therefore, I therefore, which means that he's anchoring his pleading in everything that he's argued in the previous chapters of the book. And and so in in there we we can look and he's anchoring this in the rock-solid doctrine of our union with Christ, that in him. In him is the most repeated construction of the first chapter. And then the second chapter introduces variations on that. In Christ Jesus, with Christ we are made alive. And in himself. And then arguing into the third chapter, we see that that we Jews and Gentiles were built into one body. We're built into one temple, chapter 2. We're built into one new humanity that rightly images God and honors and worships Him. So, so Paul prays for their growth at the, at the end of these chapters, right before our text here. And he, he says that he's praying that their mature discipleship would, would come about, that their growth would be made evident and sure. And then he erupts into praise in a doxology that says that God is fully able to bring this about. He's able to do more than we can ask or imagine. He can do it. He will do it. And so therefore, he says, he he, he pleads with them to walk in a manner that is seen in the gospel. What what is this manner? Well, let's, let's look right here. Humility. Gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eagerness to maintain unity. It is overt graciousness. Overt graciousness. It's, it's easy for us to gloss over what Paul is calling the Ephesians to here. It's easy for us to say, yeah, those are nice words. Yeah, I, I, I'm that way, surely. But that's, that, that makes it easy for us to just dismiss who Paul is talking to here. This is a church that is racially diverse. Jews and Gentiles. And there's a long history of hostility here. There, I mean, we're talking about riots. We're talking about state-sanctioned murder. We're talking about crippling tax policy. We're talking about terrorist assassinations by the zealots. We're talking about torture and brutality by the Roman authorities. And so it goes back and forth, back and forth through, through centuries. And, and, and here this church is now, Jew and, and, and pig-eating Gentile right beside each other in one body. Now, there would certainly be histories. There would certainly be temptations and, and, and rivalries among them. You can think, oh man, I remember when your uncle killed my dad. <sighs> what a history they have. And now they're one body? Brothers and sisters, we must lay down our lives for one another. We must, yes, lay down our preferences for our, our, our little hobby horses, our little things that we love so much for the sake of unity. Unity in the truth. Unity in the truth. So in the truth is important because we just don't, we don't, we just don't unify with, with any and everyone. There's, there's close-handed issues, or that's, uh, there's open-handed issues, and there's close-handed issues, brothers and sisters. But most, most, uh, a lot of things are open-handed issues, and we need to bear with one another in humility and gentleness. Not speaking at one another, but speaking to one another. I, I, it's much like what Paul writes to another church that's filled with Jews and Gentiles in the book of Romans. In Romans 14, 15, B, we, we pull that up there. He says, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And so he's, he's calling to memory for them. Jesus gave up heaven for you. Jesus gave up heaven for that brother. And you would say that your rights are more important than that brother for whom Christ died. Think about that. Think about how audacious that is. I can, I can remember uh, a friend of the family growing up. Her name was Marge. I won't say her last name. Uh, Marge, uh, she came to Christ late in life, and she joined the church, and she got so involved her whole family had, had passed away, and so it was just her and the church, and she was there every time the doors were open, she was volunteering at everything. Sweet March. But then, then, then one Saturday, they had a, a, a missions garage sale, a missions yard sale, where, where everyone in the church brought uh, trinkets and things from home that they didn't want anymore, and they were going to sell them and raise money for missions. Marge helped all day. She helped the night before. She helped that day. She was putting price tags on things, doing all this stuff. And, and, and then, in the middle of the day, she sees an angel statue. You know, a trinket, an angel statue. And she wants it. She loves angel statues. Not my taste, but hey, I'll defer to her on that. Uh, she loved angel statues, so she wanted it. And so she, she said, hey, how, can, I, can I have this? And the associate pastor said, yeah, five bucks. Five bucks. Oh, that, that upset Mars. I, I've been here working all day and the night before. I'm here all the time. Uh, can, can I have it? No, five bucks. I don't want to show favoritism. Five bucks. Marge, in a huff, gets angry, leaves the church, never speaks to anyone again in there. She, it goes so far, she winds up in a nursing home and she dies alone apart from her body. Over five dollars. Let's, let's, let's put things in perspective, brothers and sisters. We need one another. 
Pastor, give them the angel statue. Uh, a dear sister, dear brother, it's five bucks. It's five bucks. Spurgeon said, pride is the mother of division. Pride is the mother of division. It's totally true. And everything Paul's urging them toward here is it's relational language. Uh, to be in the church means to have relational contact with others, with one another. And the more contact you have with others, the more it reveals our faults. The more it, and married people know this. Uh, you, you get married, you know, everything's perfect from far away. And then, and then you wake up on the honeymoon and his arms draped over her, her arms draped over him, halitosis in the face. Oh, the dream is over. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, living with one another exposes one another's faults. And we must lay aside our own comforts, our own, our, our own offenses, and our own grudges. And that's, that's not just so that we can get to the point of discipleship, like, like discipleship is, 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 is this thing over here, and, and, and yes, discipleship occurs into the, as you grow into the church. But that is actually part of the discipleship process. It's, it's learning to die to yourself and to prefer others over you. Because you know what? That looks like Jesus. That looks exactly like Jesus. And that's what Jesus has done for us. So we ought to do for one another. This, this, this will look like uh, the youth in this church uh, running up to, to Pastor Kyle and saying, uh, uh, Pastor Kyle, I, I know that our older saints here, I don't know, I'll make one up. I don't know you, I don't know you guys yet. Uh, well, I, I know Bessie loves hymns. Can we sing hymns for Bessie's sake? I, I just want to see her minister to. And, and, and older saints, that will look similar in the opposite direction toward the younger saints. How, how, how can I give up my rights, my preferences for you? Because I love you like Jesus loved me. But then Paul tells the Ephesians, oh, and by the way, he anchors all this in, in the fact that he's, he's, he's a prisoner. He prefaces this with saying, hey, I, a prisoner of the Lord, Paul is, is giving up his rights for the sake of the church, for the sake of the gospel. And, and if he can do it, so can we. So can we. But then Paul tells the Ephesians that, that this unity in diverse members is rooted in God himself. Look at verses 4 through 6. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's called the economic trinity. He, he mentions each person of the trinity, and then he tells them what that person of the trinity is doing to secure their salvation. The Holy Spirit calls you into this one hope, calls you into this body. The, and the Son, what, it, what does He do? He, uh, it's faith in Him that secures our salvation. He is our predecessor in this one baptism, we're baptized, we're joined with him in his baptism, we're raised with him to life. And then the Father creates it all, plans it all, rules it all, and is glorified in it all. So our unity arises from one God in three persons, holy, holy, holy. And that is how we should reflect him. But then Paul, Paul zeroes, zeroes us in on the work of of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. Jesus. And that, that brings us to our second point. Our second point. The magnanimity of the gift giver. The marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt was poured out on each one of us with ridiculous generosity. Our, our, our attentions turned from ourselves and, and our own in, in enduring offenses of, of others to the one who gave it all up, to Christ's self-sacrifice. What, what Paul makes clear to us is that Jesus uh, gave himself up 
as an atoning sacrifice for us, for our sins. See, every, every, every divisive, every, every partisan claim is ultimately an exercise in self-righteousness. It's what it is. I'm the, I'm the good guy. I'm the good guy here. You know, talk to anyone who has a complaint about another and listen, listen closely and you'll hear how they're the righteous one. And, and, and that's exactly, and if you, you don't, you know, you can, you can go into Portland and you can just look at the bumper stickers. And every one of those bumper stickers is a proclamation of self-righteousness. There's enough self-righteousness in the world, brothers and sisters. We need to be a people of grace because our Lord was the God of grace. There's enough self-righteous marriages out there. There's enough self-righteous churches out there. There's enough self-righteous politics out there. Brothers and sisters, we must be a people marked with lavish graciousness, ridiculous graciousness toward one another. The gospel is premised on our own unrighteousness. Christ had to die for me. Christ had to die for you. We come not, not, not deluding ourselves as, as though we, we, we come perfect or that we somehow got ourselves clean before we came to Jesus. No, we come to his matchless grace. We come to him and we see that he is a good giver of his righteousness to us. And that draws us to him. That draws us to him. We are eager to meet him. The only righteous one, Jesus, laid down his life, taking, taking on our sin so that he can give us his righteousness. So friend, if, if, if this is your first time in church, if you're, if you're kind of on the outside looking in there, he died so that you can come in. So that your unrighteousness, just like all of our unrighteousness, can be exchanged for his perfect obedience, his perfect righteousness. And he didn't rub it in and say, well, you know, try harder till you get closer to me. No, he gives it freely. He gives it willingly. Come to him. Repent. Turn to him as the risen Lord of your life. And you will be graciously welcomed into his kingdom, and into fellowship with God. You can do that today. Repent. Declare him Lord. You can, you can be welcomed in. And speaking to a church filled with, with Jews and Gentiles, Paul points them back to Psalm 68. You can read it there, verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high... He led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, Psalm 68 is written as a call to hope in the saving power of the Lord, to, to look back and see all that he's done as they're delivering the ark up Mount Zion to, 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 to where it's going to sit, and it's going to declare, hey, this is, God lives here. God is with us. And it's declaring that to all the Gentile nations. This is, a, this is a missionary psalm because the, the, the nations that, that God has warred against are looking on, and what's interesting in the psalm is, is the Lord is the hero of it, and he conquers his enemies, and then he brings a captive people in. He brings them into his temple, and then we see something magnificent. In his sanctuaries there, the Gentiles are worshiping. Egyptians, Ethiopians, kingdoms of the earth, they're worshiping there, with Israel in the sanctuary. Paul is telling us that this is our story. Let's look at verse 9. He says, he says this, and saying, he ascended, what does it mean but that he descended? And it's talking, he's saying, it's Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of the psalm there. And he's, he descended into the lower parts. He descended into death. He, he went into the grave for a people, to purchase a people and then when he's resurrected and he ascends to heaven, he, lay, he leads captives in his train. Who, who are these captives? Well, I, I take it to be those who, who Paul refers to in 2 Timothy 2.26 as, as those who had been taken captive by the devil to do his will. 
to do Satan's will. This is every one of us. Every one of us who has, who has been blinded by Satan. And, and we've been using our talents for his kingdom as a war, as an opposition against Christ's kingdom. And then, and then Jesus comes in and, and tears us out of that kingdom of darkness and places us in his kingdom, in his kingdom. This is, this is made clear in his temple where we now join in the worship of the Lord. So th- th- this is made very clear because when it says he gave, he actually uh, uh, switches the word, which you'll read in your Hebrews, uh, 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 what you'll read in your, uh, uh, if you go back to the Old Testament and you check out Psalm, it'll say he received gifts from men. But Paul is actually reflecting the, 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 the Hebrew there because it's like, it's, it's an idea of the spoils of war. And so he takes the spoils that he might redistribute them to his people. And so he takes these captives, he takes these, these slaves to Satan using their gifts for evil, and he brings them into his temple, his church, and he gives them as gifts that they might be to the worship of the Lord. It's like like that that song the Getty sang, with the sword that makes the wounded whole. These captives are no longer enemies. No, these captives are now made whole. He, He has liberated them. And if that were not enough, he gives them his righteousness. He gives them as gifts to his people. He gives and he gives and he gives again. So what what are these gifts that Jesus gives? The apostles, he tells us, verse 11, the apostles and prophets. And that that, that reflects the the beginning of the church, the the, the foundation of the church that he talks about in Ephesians 2.20. So he, the, the, those are the foundations of the church. And then he says, the evangelists. What, who are the evangelists? That's the, the church planters, like, like Par, Barnabas, like Paul even. Paul goes in the apostle category, though. Or, or Philip, or Silas, or, or, or the missionaries in your church, because this continues today. The missionaries in the church you send out that are telling people about Jesus and planting churches and ministering to the body there. And then, and then it gets local. It's local. He says he also gives the shepherds or pastors and the teachers. Brothers and sisters, your pastors, your elders are gifts to you from Jesus himself for your good. Now, 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 pastors, elders, let's be clear. This, This does not mean that you are God's gift to the world. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean, hey, hey, I'm here. You're welcome. No, that's not what he's talking about. No, inasmuch as they humbly discharge the ministry of their office, that is God's gift. That is Jesus' gift to you, brothers and sisters. So we should not neglect Jesus' gifts. This is his plan. This is his doing. So we must attend to the public reading of Scripture. We must attend to the preaching of the Word. Now, now, now by this, uh, we, we mean that we should listen to sermons at your local church. Because that, that's what's seen in verses 1 through 3, and in the following verses of this, it's the relational language. We do this with one another. We can't, we can't do this just on the internet alone and just... Just, oh man, okay, I, I, I'll watch John Piper this morning, and that's my fill for the week. I'm, I, I know people who will tithe and send their money to the, the famous preacher that they like to watch. That's not being a part of a local church. Jesus calls us in. So we must attend to the preaching of the word at the local church. Listen to him. Don't be like Tim the Toolman Taylor here. Don't be, don't, don't be like him when it comes to your Christian walk. Jesus' plan is the only plan. And the local church is the locus. It is the arena for that plan. And that brings us to uh, number three, the effect of these magnanimous gifts. Point three, it's the maturing 
ministry of the gift getters. Who are the gift getters? Well, that's us in the church, in the body. We get the gifts. Let's look at 12 through 14. The purpose to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We, we immediately have Paul describing to us the, the purpose for the gifts from Jesus. The, the saints, us, members of the local church, uh, which means that contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches, that, that, uh, that the, the ministry of the church is, is done by the priests and the magisterium, and the laity just kind of, you know, sends money in. Okay, you, you guys do the work of the ministry. Here I am, I'll give you a check, and I'll come in every now and then. Right? No, that is not what Paul is telling us here. It says, is you are the ministers of the church. Did you know that? That you, the body, minister to one another. You are the ministers at Damascus Community Church. We're responsible to one another and for one another. We're responsible to build each other up in Christ. And that, that, that's not a question of, of priorities. That's a question of obedience. Do you have time for the church? If you don't have time for the church, then you're simply not obeying. Are you ministering? Are you encouraging? Are you keeping one another accountable? If not, here's, here's your opportunity. Here's your call from Jesus to step into that. A, a lot of ink has been spilt in, in, in recent years on the issue of critical race theory. And, and it's good for us to, to address uh, departures from biblical truth, and it's good for us to, to, to develop a Christian worldview and to see how other worldviews are contrary to that, absolutely. But there's another ideology that's, I think, far more sinister, that actually is readily present among our churches. Uh, and, and it has actually resulted historically in atheistic regimes in the murder of Christians, and in the sexual anarchy that we see in our doorstep every day. What is that? That's Rousseauian individualism, rancid individualism. This can be seen whenever someone says, well, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need a church to get in my business there. That's, that's, that's seen when we say, hey, my church is out in nature. That's, that's, that's seen when we say, hey, it's, it's, it's me, and, me and God, me and God, no one else. That's what that is. Rousseauian individualism. It is the exact opposite of what Jesus is calling us to here, which is an involvement with an identifiable, uh, a covenanted local body. That, that's what Jesus calls us to. Maybe, maybe you've been kind of flirting with church. Maybe you've been kind of uh, attending online. Well, brothers and sisters, it's time to join a Bible teaching community. It's, it's time to join. It's clear. You should join. That's Jesus' discipleship plan for you. Don't be Tim the Toolman Taylor. Join a church. Paul tells us that this building up will result in our unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, brothers and sisters, doctrine matters. Doctrine matters. Uh, one of the symptoms of individualism is an, a, a hatred or an apathy toward doctrine, toward theology. And, and there can be a, a legitimate concern here that, oh man, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be puffed up. Or there could be a legitimate concern that, oh man, that, that makes me cold. It shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be that. More often than, 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 than that concern, though, what's, what's actually presenting, what lies behind doctrinal apathy is a desire for freedom from it. For freedom from it. And that might seem liberating and dynamic, uh, much in the same way that uh, not getting a marriage license seems liberating and dynamic. 
But that's not hot passion, brothers and sisters. That's cold indifference and self-preservation. We should be a doctrinal people. Dr. Moeller, Dr. Albert Moeller says this, to be a Christian is to be bound by words. We must be bound by words. We should be a people, a doctrinal people, people committed to covenant and confession. And finally, let's look at 15 through 16 here. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Expositional sermons, and that's, that's what we're doing here this morning, expositional sermons are exactly what we need. I think God's word prescribes it. Uh, but, but we don't just want to be a consumer of expositional preaching. We want to be an expositional people speaking the truth in love. We must be built up in the knowledge of the Son of God, of the Word of God, that's that doctrine for you, so that we can speak the truth in love to one another. And that's not calling every one of us to be a preacher and then get up in the pulpit. That's calling every one of us to know the word and to speak the word to one another. To, 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 to have it in our art that we present to the church. To have it in our counseling conversations that we have with one another. We must be an expositional people. And, and by that speaking the truth in love, uh, that's not talking about speaking at one another. That's like 90% of what goes on online, speaking at one another. We are to speak the truth in love with one another, to one another, building one another up in love. And the result is that we, we have maturity in Christ, maturity in Christ displaying to the watching world his glory and his goodness. So friends, Will you follow Jesus' plan for discipleship? If you're not a Christian, will, will you become a Christian? Will you run to him who gave up his life that you might have life abundant? If, if, if you're flirting with the church, that means coming in and joining. And if, if you're a member here at Damascus, that means becoming an expositional people. That, that, that means pursuing loving unity in the truth. That means not neglecting Jesus' gifts. And that means becoming an expositional people. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. We thank you that you gave us your word, you gave us your spirit, you gave us gifts by which we become more like your son, Jesus. May we be that people. In Christ's name and for his sake we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us for our service this morning. My name is Andy McClellan. I'm one of the pastors here at Damascus Community Church. Uh, we hope that you sense the love of Jesus in every aspect of the service today. We hope that you were led into worship, Jesus as our Savior and King. And we hope that today advanced you even further toward walking faithfully as a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, if anything that we said this morning prompted any questions that you might have, or if you have questions about Damascus Community Church, want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, uh, or if you have any comments you'd like to give to us, we would love to hear from you. Uh, the easiest way is probably to go to our homepage of our website at damascuscc.org. Uh, click on the button that says Contact Us. That'll take you to a communication card, and you can fill that out and let us know whatever your questions or comments are. Uh, if you'd prefer email, you can email to us at dcc at damascuscc.org. Uh, or you can give us a call, 503-658-3179. Uh, we would love to hear from you, 
and we hope to see you again.